my grandpa just died today. I was kind of contemplating it and reading Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time. And uh, it was my step-grandpa, so, but he was pretty close to me. Um, he was older, he was 98, I think. Um, so it was somewhat expected. Uh, he lives in Ohio now, so I don't see him very often. But he is the grandpa in my story that I talk about. Sent me those books when I asked him if he'd help me out. And uh, one of the books he talked about was Stephen Hawking. And on this day, as I'm thinking about, you know, life and death, and um, this chapter 8, this is the fate and origin of the universe. And you could bring this down to, like, the fate and the origin of you and I as individuals in the universe. Hawking says, Einstein's general theory of relativity predicted that space-time began at the Big Bang singularity and would come to end either at the Big Crunch singularity or at a singularity inside a black hole of a local region. Now, that's all physicist talk, and <clears throat> when it bring it down to our lives, my grandpa's life, my life, your life, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of singularities, points of origin. My grandpa, Charles, um, he was born in, I believe, 1915, and or 1916, and, no, actually, 1917, sorry. Uh, and that's an origin point, and you were born at some time in this thing we call space-time continuum, time as we know it, calendar time. It's a clock running here. That's the time, we would say. But it's a point of singularity. Before it, there was nothing. And after it, there was something. Before you were born, there was no you. There was no Grandpa Charles. And uh, by the way, I wasn't sure I was going to record a video on this. It's kind of a sensitive family thing. But I thought, why be afraid of the subject of dying and death? We live in a world where parents are afraid to talk to their kids about money and sex and conflict and all the real stuff. So that doesn't seem to work. Doesn't seem to make the world a better place. So uh, singular singularity points in your life where you can look back and had that day not been, your life would be in a totally different direction. You met a certain person. You didn't meet a certain person. You said no to an opportunity. You said yes. And so life becomes that initial singularity when you're born. And of course, today uh, is the day of singularity, that ending for Charles and his time here on Earth. And uh, within those two beginning and origin and ending points, I, I have to think that there's also points of singularity in opportunities that we say yes or no to. You know, Charles was a very fascinating person because He's one of the most knowledgeable people that I ever met. My grandma married him. My grandpa died when I was eight. And my grandma got remarried to Charles when I was probably, oh, I don't know, years later. But my grandma was about 75 and she got remarried. She found love again. It's kind of a cool story, right? You would think at 75, my grandma's a widow, that, that there was no option for an origin point of singularity and new love but there was there was an opportunity my grandpa charles began to send my grandmother um love letters his wife had died about a decade before my mom grandma and they had known each other for many many years ago 50 years before and so they revived an old relationship it's a very beautiful story and he kind of wooed my grandma with these great poems. My grandma likes smart men, and he was smart and witty, and he wrote these poems. And my grandma was fascinated by this man who was writing her from... He lived in Minnesota. My grandma lived in San Diego. So these letters went back and forth. He came into my life. You know, I, I called him Charles. Uh, he didn't want to be called grandfather. He didn't want to be somebody. He wasn't. He wasn't my blood grandfather. But I saw him as a grandfather, and... He, in addition to my grandma, was it was also an origin point for me to be around such an intelligent man. He was a PhD in chemistry and probably the most knowledgeable person I've ever met. Uh, had a 20,000 book library when he moved to 
San Diego. When he met my grandma, he lived in Bemidji, Minnesota. My grandma lived in San Diego. He wanted her to move to Minnesota. My grandma's a strong woman. She said, I am moving from San sunny San Diego to snowy Minnesota. If you want to marry me, you're going to move here. <laughs> so my grandma was the boss in that conversation. and He moved to San Diego. And my grandma, um, you know, so the, the relationship began. And, and I was spent a lot of time around my grandma growing up. And uh, Charles began to introduce me to books and knowledge and the power of the mind and how much I, I think all of us only live it. <clears throat> I think there's 12 levels of life, something like that. And uh, most of us live at level one, maybe level two. But there's 10 times, you know, 10, 11 levels above our potential. And Charles intellectually lived at that high level. 20,000 books had an immense he spoke about 10 languages or at least could read and write. 10 languages, things, hard languages, Finnish and, you know, Russian and, and Hebrew and all these different ones. And so my mind was expanded to like, wow, you can know a lot of stuff. People often ask me, Ty, you have a, seem to have a good memory. And I'm like, no, I don't have it compared to Charles, law 33%, what I talk about in my TEDx talk, spend time around people who kind of embarrass you. <laughs> he embarrassed my level. Even now, um, looking back, like, I'm like, wow. He was 70. He was a chess master. I play chess, but, you know, a chess master is very high level. Like He was pro I don't know his exact ranking, but 2200 to 2400 probably. When he was younger, he could play multiple chess, mas chess experts. They could look at the board. He would turn his back to the board, and they could play him. And he beat them all by memorizing all their moves and countering. So... An immense, if he was a, if his brain, the metaphor, if it was a grown man's body, he would have been like Shaquille O'Neal, seven foot body, you know, 350 pound muscle guy. So there was a lesson for me there. It was an origin point, a point of singularity in my life that my grandma took that opportunity, acted upon it, took a risk to get remarried and find love again in her 70s. But that was a singularity point, not only for her life story. And how her life evolved. And now today, that part of her life has closed as he's died. Although he still lives on in memories and thoughts and in the actions of those people that he affected like me. You're watching. There's a little bit of a ripple effect. The butterfly effect. Chaos theory. It doesn't always have to be chaotic. Sometimes the butterfly effect is beautiful, you know. And so, um, it's been an interesting day. You know, when you know somebody's going to die, and so they're older, it's not as tragic as if, you know, you see children dying. There was a shooting in Riverside, California, uh, here, where some people just opened fire and killed all these people, and you had young people in there, and you know, it's like all that opportunity snuffed out. But that's how the story of this universe goes, that these points of origin and these points of ending are not always in our control. Now, obviously, you and I know that. But do we really know it? Because it's one thing to know intellectually. It's another thing to feel it and therefore act upon it. So whenever days like this come, you know, I want to honor the life and death of my grandfather, Charles. Um, but I also want to honor it by living, you know, that's what he believed. Is that he wasn't a very religious person. He believed in religion acted out in everyday life, simple religion, humility. Uh, and I admired that about him. You know, no matter what religion you are, I think all religions believe religion not acted out on a day-by-day -day basis is no religion after all. It's just a pipe dream in an imaginary world. So uh, as I honor him, you know, I, I try to take the time as I think he would want me. He wasn't big into funerals and things like this I don't think he cared about the elaborate processes of honoring his body because he wanted to live on in memories and thoughts and in behaviors and uh, if he you know he's a chemist left some mark on the world he's a very smart guy I think he graduated college at 16 years old um, so he's done that so Charles I know that uh, you can't hear this, but uh, thank you for taking time 
to be involved in my life when I was young, to write me that letter back, to send me those books, now those books and that story has been an origin point, not only a point of singularity and origin in my life, but now people follow, some people follow the stuff that I do and you've passed on beyond the grave. You've outlived the grave. You've conquered death, maybe you could say. Not that anybody can completely conquer death, but you conquer death in memory, in spirit. And uh, so, yeah, it's been an emotion. It's funny because I'm not a very emotional person. Um, but, uh, on a, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of sad and things like that. But I am sad. I didn't think I would be sad. But, you know, uh, I am sad. Because sometimes you think, um, what could you have done different? I wish I had learned more from him. I wish I had, you know, offered more back. I couldn't offer that much. I was a little kid, and even it was, it, he, he had a stroke uh, about five or ten years ago and lost a lot of that intellectual power that he once had. But, uh, so I wish before he had had the stroke, I could. I, I was traveling the world and stuff like that. Didn't quite spend enough time with him. They always say, at the end of your life, you look back and you go, man, I wish I'd spent more time with my loved ones. It's not always possible because we all have obligations. But, you know, for those of you watching who have a grandma and grandpa that live far away, get on a plane, you know. They ain't always going to be there. So, uh... And hopefully that becomes a point of origin too. getting on that plane, a new experience, new opportunity to learn the wisdom of people who have been through a lot. He, my grandma's luckily still alive at 97, born in 1918. You know, my grandma lived through World War, she was born in World War I, so was Charles. He told me memories of World War I veterans. When they were alive, there were still Civil War veterans alive. My grandma and grandpa remember. Kind of mind-blowing. And then they lived through the modern age where computers and cars and the nuclear age and through the Cold War. And they were survivors. And uh, it's not that easy to survive in the world. You know what I mean? People are like 19 years old and they're like, wow, I've been through so much. I'm like, well, huh. look at people who are older than you alive and dead and what they've gone through puts life in perspective and i think as i read this brief history of time with stephen hawking and think about my grandfather charles uh, i also think about you know the struggle the struggle he was born in poverty in new york city and um how the ability to overcome this struggle it's number one, um, the most important skill any of us will possess. Without that, you're not alive to even contemplate anything. And it's a struggle physically, and it's a struggle financially, and it's a struggle mentally, and it's a struggle against adversaries, people who don't have your best interests at heart, and it's sometimes a struggle against your own family who sometimes doesn't have your own best interests at heart. But you go and you survive if you understand opportunities. And I think that's what I think most, you know, life is the famous Robert Frost, you know, there's a two paths, he was walking through the woods, and the road split, the trail split, and he took the path less trod on, where less people had walked, maybe it's a harder path, and he said that's made all the difference in his life, so to take the higher ground, when everybody else is playing, to sometimes sit back and think, when everybody is uh, at a dead end job and hating their life to go through the grind that will get you out of that situation into the next situation, what greater ability could anyone possess? This is the Stephen Hawking origin story of the beginning of the universe. Whether you're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, uh, Christians, Muslims, many religions would believe in that point of singularity. You might not call it the Big Bang, you might call it the creation moment but there's creation moments happening today many babies will be born today new point of origin for them might not be a new origin for you and i 
But today's a new day. Tomorrow will be a new day. It's up to you and I to seize the moment. Carpe diem. Do you suck the marrow out of life? As the great uh, American poet said. These are all origin points. To recognize opportunities. To create opportunities. To learn from others. Like I learned from Charles. I think he's one of the reasons that I'm into mentors. If you see my TEDx talk. One of the reasons I talk about the law 33%. One of the reasons I read a book a day. It's not to show off. <laughs> People think that. Even to go so far as sometimes the re it's why I have a Lamborghini. Because it motivates me to stay on a hard path. And it's hard for people to believe that, but it, that is the reason. It's easy to, I can go backwards. I can, I, I, I don't have to have materialistic things. I've already done that experiment for a decade. I went five years with no toilet. Live with the Amish. Live on a farm with no electricity. I've done that and it's a great life. Uh, and it brings a different set of rewards and a different set of challenges and it has its different set of limitations and different opportunities. So now I'm in a different place and there was a new origin in my life and maybe one day that will close. Well, uh, not one day, it will close. And this is the perspective that Stephen Hawking book says, at the end, there's the big crunch. You know, life is an expansion and you had opportunities and opportunities, but eventually the opportunities go away. All of us will get old. This is Mother Nature, or you could say God. And as Charles Barkley, the basketball player, says, Father Time waits for no man, no woman. There is something bigger than us operating, so you must have respect. And you must say, the time, there is a time. And there is a time for me to seize the moment. And there's a time for me to remember I better seize the moment even though the moment's not yet here. That's patiently waiting for the opportunity. And that's sometimes harder than seizing the moment. Because as Charlie Monger's grandfather told him, Charlie Monger listened to his grandfather. So it's a rare life that's bathed in opportunity all the way. Most people only get a few chances. So when you see an opportunity and you're sure, do it and don't do it small. Seize the moment when it's there. But realize it's not always there. And some of us, some of you, maybe you, will have an easier life than me or Charles. Your path of, through this universe, your points of singularity, origin, and ending will be easier. And some will be harder. And so it's really not a race against the other operators in the universe. It's a, although we must respect the other people, the other forces, it's mostly about ourselves. Life is basically a competition with yourself. When we don't like that we procrastinate, who are we competing against? Ourself. When we don't like our bodies because they're out of shape, it's a competition with ourselves. When we don't like our job, it's not a competition with the boss of the job we don't like. It's a competition of why have we gotten ourselves into that place to start with and why have we stayed there for too long. You know, when you receive criticism, it's not an indictment of you necessarily. Sometimes it is. Ted Danson, I had lunch with him, the actor, and he, he's good friends with the Clintons, Bill Clinton, and he said, Bill Clinton, whenever somebody criticizes him, he really thinks about what they say, whether it's rooted in fact or not. So it's a competition with himself to analyze the criticisms of others and be able to be at peace if they're falsely accusing him or to be able to be a man of action and change if the criticism is justified. That's another competition. Everything in competition with ourselves. The world's aggressive. People are aggressive. The forces of Mother Nature are aggressive. The um, economic system, all economic systems. We've tried a lot of them. We've tried capitalism. We've tried communism. There's been socialism, fascism. There's all, and on every variety, there's been no money. The Native Americans, and uh, you know, they, they exchanged shells at one point. And even before shells, there was just, a, there was nothing, you know, there was no capitalistic structure at all, but it was still a struggle. And so between the origin points, there's the struggle. And for some people, that's depressing. For other people, it's beautiful because at the end of Charles' life, you look back and you go, well done, Charles. 
you know, you raised a family, you influenced people that weren't blood related, but you adopted them into your life. You lived a good life. You contributed through your career. You contributed intellectually, socially, personally. You contributed to the love life of my grandmother. And uh, I don't think there's much more you can hope for. Maybe you hope for something after death. That's great. You can do that too. They're not if and or uh, or they can be. They don't have and situations. You could maybe, maybe there's his life after death. I don't know. You might know. Often, many, many people in this world consider themselves an expert of what happens after death. I think it's hard to know because you and I haven't lived it. But you may have some authority and knowledge that I don't have. That's good. I hope to learn from you. But I do know I try to control what I can control. And uh, I try to control my recollections, my reflections, my emotions, and harness them. They are the great racehorse that races throughout our brains. Our thoughts are over analyzing situation, our paralysis by over analysis, our fears of, oh man, Charles died. I'm mortal. Well, that, that's a double edged sword. There's good to contemplating that, but there's also a paralysis that can happen. You must act as if you're alive, as if you're a blazing star. You will die. Any point that's fixed, like Stephen Hawking talks about, the origin of the universe, or the crunching singularity point, they're fixed. So you never fear fixed points, because you can do nothing about them. But you must fear the day-to-day -day variables that would keep you and I from getting to the end point and going, ooh, we did awesome stuff. Like Chief Tecumseh, one of my favorite poems. Like the, uh, he was a uh, Shawnee, I think was the name of the Indian tribes in the 1800s. Uh, and he said, so you live your life that the fear of death does not enter into your heart. I always thought that was profound. So live your life. He didn't say, so be fearful. So freak out. He said, so live. Charles lived. And to that, I honor him. And uh, I hope one day I can do half as well as him. So live your life that the fear of death does not even enter into your mind, Chief Tecumseh said. He said, love your life, perfect your life, beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and its purpose in the service of your people. I always thought that was a beautiful sentence. Love your life. Perfect your life. To love, but not love so much that you don't work on it. Some people I know love themselves so much that they forget the second part of the poem. Love your life. Perfect your life. And then some people get those first two. They love their own life. They perfect their own life, but they forget the third part beautify all things in your life. That means beautify the lives of all people that you touch one way or another. Beautify their lives. And then he goes on to say, people often ask me, you know, people say, Ty, how do I know the purpose of my life? Well, Chief Tecumseh centuries ago said, make your uh, purpose of your life to be the service of your people. Now, this is a loaded word to me. You know, Charles, you can't serve everybody. No man can serve two masters, as they say. But he had his world that he served. He was a chemist. He was a scientist. He was more of an intellectual. And so he stuck to his own. He honored other people outside of that, that, but that was his people. And I think each of us, we must find our tribe. Sometimes I get people that criticize me and the things that I do, and I go, okay. Maybe some of it's justified and some of it isn't. And those people that choose to do that, I say, well, what might be going on here, you're not my people and I'm not yours. We don't resonate with each other. You go find your tribe. Nothing wrong with tribes as long as the tribes aren't always at war with each other, but there's personality types that get along. There's styles of life. So he said, and make your life's purpose the service of your people. That means you must find them and you must serve. And so you must live some of your life selfishly. He said, love your life, perfect your own life. And beautify all things that you encounter, all things in your life. 
And he said, don't be, this is Chief Tecumseh again, and I have to think Charles knew this poem. He knew a lot of stuff. I once tried to stump him on a history question. He knew everything about history. Immense memory, photographic memory. I said, Charles, are there things you don't know about history? I was like 13. He's like, no, oh, yeah, lots of things I don't know. I was like, ooh, and uh, I was like, let me see, if I pick a hard subject. Do you know anything about the French Foreign Legion? And he said, no, I don't know much about that. And then he went on to talk for two hours about the French Foreign Legion. I'll never forget that. He wasn't trying to show off. He just had an immense memory. And uh, this chief to come some poem, I'm sure he encountered it. And the end of this poem says, And when it comes your time to die, do not be like those who weep and cry and ask for a little bit more time to live their life over again. Chief Tecumseh said, don't be like that. Many people are like that because they didn't live between the two points of singularity, the origin of their life and the end of their life. And so they go, I need more time. I need more time. But time isn't always there for us. And so he ends and he says, don't be like those people. He said, when it comes your time to cross over the great divide between this time we call planet Earth human life cross that great divide he said be like a hero sing like a hero going home and so i'm sure charles um nobody wants to die i don't think it goes against our innate dna but charles i wasn't there unfortunately he was in ohio far away with his his blood relatives but uh I believe that he went home like a hero. You know, he went somewhere else. I don't know. Maybe he went into the dirt, the dust. He was more of an atheist. He'd probably think he's gone. But of course, the basic laws of physics in the universe is all energy is neither created nor destroyed anymore. Meaning his, even if you're an atheist, he breaks down, you know, the protein breaks down into nitrogen, which breaks down into nit nitrates and nitrites that go into soil and plants use those for fertilizer and so all of us just go back to the dirt one way or another and so our energy in that sense is recirculated throughout the universe or if you're religious he's somewhere hopefully better um but i believe he sang his life song through his day-to-day -day living and uh that he went like a hero going home and uh i don't know what else you want out of life you know you can want millions of dollars and billions of dollars and i'm all for making money if you can do it because it's fuel and freedom uh, to do bigger things for yourself and for others. I'm all for that, but I'm never fooled by money. And he wasn't either. And he was financially a wise man. He was able to help my grandma out, help our family out at some level. Just thankful for that. Uh, but you know, it's singing your song is how you lived between the points. And so... I'm recording this as a memory of my thoughts in the moment. <clears throat> I've chosen for various reasons, haven't always done this, to share my moments of my life with other people. I hope you get some value for this. More importantly, maybe one day other people who didn't know Charles or knew him only briefly can watch this and say, that was a great man, great in his own way, uh, not perfect. But in his not being perfect, there is a sort of perfectness because that's the perfect human life. Full of our bumps, bruises, flaws, idiosyncrasies. Things some people hate about us. Things some people love about us. But at the end of the day, Stephen Hawking was right. I don't know if the physics, I'm sure, will change as science gets more powerful. But there was some kind of origin and will be some type of end for all of us. But we can live on through our accomplishments. We can live on through our humanity, uh, the lessons that our life teaches. So, yeah, I don't know if I have an exact lesson in something like this. I don't have all the answers. It's more of a contemplation. It's more of thoughts of a person. Well, his grandpa died. So, Charles... Sorry that I wasn't there, um, but uh, sad, but also thankful.
Um, I wish some of my younger brothers could have remembered you. <laughs> you had a stroke when they were old enough to really remember you and weren't quite as sharp as you once were. But maybe I'll have them watch this video. My cousin Maya, some of you know, and Aaron and Ben and them. They don't remember Charles. You're a good man to me. So, uh, thank you.